Hello. So, did everyone had a good morning? Everyone had a great breakfast? Breakfast? No breakfast, okay. <laughs> okay, welcome very much to our session Collaborative Learning Systems in Drupal, a case study. I hope you'll have some fun. And even though for some it might be still a little early, for some from other time zones it might be freaking late because you're coming from all over the world, I assume. Uh, I'm from Germany, so um, when I came from the, um, from the flight, I was like, oh, what's the time zone? But anyway, we're here, and um, I hope you enjoy our session, and I'll give to Ephraim for the first part. Thank you, Fabian. Um, as Fabian mentioned, I'm Avram. I help build this site as a project manager at Trellon, along with all the other fine folks there, especially Fabian, of course. Yeah, um, when we did this project together with PSI, and what PSI is, you'll learn in just a second, um, I, had be, I was the tech lead on the project, so I devised kind of the architecture and everything, how this will work, and which Drupal modules to use, and today we hope to share some of that wisdom with you. But before we get started, let's just make sure we're all in the right place. Yeah, make sure nobody wandered in here or is going to get really bored. This is, as we mentioned, Collaborative Learning Systems in Drupal, a case study, and we're going to talk about how we built a really great learning management site that was social, collaborative, and rewarding using some very common Drupal modules and, of course, a bit of glue. So this session is for you if you're an education professional. Maybe you work at a university or with a university, at a school, you want to build some online courses in Drupal. Maybe you're a nonprofit organization or just a private individual who is really interested in learning management systems. If that's the case, you're in the right place. If you're a beginner, this session is also for you. We're not going to be assuming any advanced Drupal knowledge, and in fact, we're going to be introducing some very common Drupal modules that will probably be very useful to you in all sorts of other Drupal projects as well. So, if what I've said fits you, that's great, you're in the right place. If not, now's your chance to flee. We'll turn around, close our eyes. No hard feelings. Everyone still here? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, glad you made the choice to stay. I hope you don't regret it. So, we want to introduce our partner first on this project, which was Population Services International, also known as PSI. They're a global health organization that uses marketing skills and techniques to help improve the health of people in the developing world, focusing specifically on HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, and family planning, among other health challenges. So the Learning and Performance Department at PSI um, they were our partner during this initiative, and they helped shape the vision around learning for this project. Uh, they've, worn, they've won a number of awards related to online learning in the past, so they were really the ideal partner to put together a learning management system with some great uh, other features on top. So, what were we to do here? Our goal was to build an LMS to teach marketing skills to teams based all around the world that they then used to teach health skills. Um, uh, one moment. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Not so fast, not so fast. Uh, first of all, I would like to know, and that was probably the first question I asked myself when we got this project and saw the project brief, what the heck is an LMS? <laughs> So what is this LMS thing, and uh, can it cook? Yeah. Well, th thanks for pointing that out, Fabian. You're right. We never said what an LMS is. And if you've been sitting here for the past five minutes listening to us talk and had no idea what we were saying, thank you for your patience. But we should probably tell you what an LMS is. LMS stands for Learning Management System. And it's a way that you can organize and deliver online courses or other online learning modules to users throughout the web. So LMSs are really taking off right now. We have here 
a number of the giants in the LMS space, uh, particularly around MOOCs or massive open online courses. Uh, you can see some of the big ones like Udacity, Coursera, Khan Academy. And some of these are actually right now partnering with some of the most prestigious universities in the country. So LMSs are big. So back to our task, building an LMS to teach marketable skills to teams based around the world. Got it. But what else? Ooh, sorry. Not functioning. So the other part, making it social, collaborative, and rewarding. So I know what you're all thinking right now. Those are some really nice buzzwords. So let's move on, and you'll learn a little bit about what we mean by these terms. So um, to make it social, what we want to do is we want to have, um, first of all, we want the possibility for users to interact. And for that, we introduce chat. Now, everyone will say, well, chat, OK. I have Facebook, I have this chat at the bottom. What's innovation there? That's something I can get from everywhere. It's just a module to install. So what we did, we took chat a little further. What we um, implement is we made it possible for the chat to integrate it within peer groups. That means that learners that were learning on the system could combine together and you could always call your mentor, chat with your mentor, you can always um, chat with your peers in this learning group. And with that, the chat um, became something much more than just being able to have some, some buddies and friends you can chat with, but it helped the interactive learning experience in there. The other thing is that, eh, too fast. Excuse me. <laughs> No problem. Um, the other thing was that um, really these peer groups should be locally based. So with PSI, they have lots of local groups like country groups. And so groups should be grouped on these um, geographic areas. And within these geographic areas, you had one who is your kind of country representative, and you have other people that are learning together within this country. And um, that was making the experience less that you were kind of just taking a course here, but um, that you were also um, learning together on a course. And that was very important. So the next thing here was to collaborate and, oh, um, didn't we want to throw it that slide? Um, <laughs> no, collaboration obviously should not be like that. Um, that you're saying, well, that's, that's all their fault. Um, I didn't do that. There was the other one. But it should be ex the exact opposite. Um, of course, it should be you're working together, you're learning together, and you're making a, um, a great thing together. And um, for PSI specifically, that means that the course was kind of um, giving you something where you work together on a work document. That means you were learning how to build that work document, then you were learning how to do that work document better, which is called a creative brief, and we come to that a little later in more detail. And um, then you had to actually create a work document. And for that, um, PSI was trying to be able that users could work together on that and collaborate together on that. So one person in the peer group was kind of starting this creative brief and another one was able to comment on it and just say, hey, this is great or oh, I think I would write this a little different. And so um, really these country teams were making things much better in that. And um, this especially made it possible for the work, doc work document to receive several rounds of feedback. So that um, really you were first working with your peers, then you're putting it to your mentor, getting feedback again, then it's going to the country representative, and if he's okay with it, then it gets published. And now this marketing brief is really used. So it's not just done for the sake of doing it, but it's something that's a nice work product. And that's kind of the next thing that we have here, and that is it's very rewarding if you work on something that's then actually used, and, and not that you're kind of doing this course and you're like, 
Well, let's calculate one plus one. Okay, it's two, I learned that. And now I do this and that, etc. So um, um, we even had fun when we ourselves kind of tried the system because it was kind of like, yeah, I've progressed through this. <laughs> and um, this was really, yeah. So there was one part of the fun, the other part, for part of the fun would be the gamification. So who of you know what gamification is? Oh, quite a lot, cool. For the other ones of you, gamification is, and I'm explaining it from a little different standpoint, you have this game. Who of you played games yet? <laughs> okay, almost everyone. So, and then there are those games and you're like having, um, you're having a certain health level and you're a magician and you're like fighting your way through the dungeon and then you've beaten the end boss and it says, level up, you've progressed, you are now a master magician. And um, on the other hand, um, you have those games where you're playing Super Mario or whatever and um, you're just getting the score and it's just going up and up and up and you're like, yeah, a new high score. <laughs> and gamification is wanting to bring this into, into the... Um, into the world of collaborative learning. So what we had here was, um, do we have another slide? Yeah, no. no. Okay, so what we had here was, um, we had badges and points, but we come to that later in more detail, where um, you get the, for example, the Chat Ninja badge, um, because you've chatted all day long, <laughs> or you've gotten, um, so many points that now you're a marketing expert and you then can be a mentor for other people. And that really made it nice. So, and here we are presenting the modules. Who knows them all? One person. Who knows 50%? Oh, that's cool. Okay, and who would consider themselves an expert in all of that? Great. If not, I would have asked you to leave the room. <laughs> so what we will present you is organic groups, Drupal chat with a very slight idea that we will use uh, Node.js. Might have heard, might have not heard. Achievements module, user points, workbench, and rules. And uh, first of all, let's do a very slight intro to organic groups. So um, this is not organic groups, but organic chemistry. But I think um, even me, when I started with organic groups, I was like, organic chemistry was easier. So um, I then watched some nice screencasts. Um, they are very good ones for introduction to organic groups and I really encourage if you want to do something with that, watch that um, screencast series of either modules and Ravelt or the other one um, because it's really helpful to understand what you can do with it before kind of just doing something and then like, uh, what are we doing now? So um, organic groups is um, a great system for grouping people together and it was an ideal case for us. And here I give to Afram. Right, so organic groups is a really versatile module. You can do a lot with it. But the basic idea behind it is permission silos. Meaning you can set up a section of your site that operates almost independently in a lot of ways. You've got its own content, its own user roles, its own permissions. So you can treat it kind of like a site within a site almost. And the way organic groups would work then, depending on how you set things up, users may be required to actually join a group in order to view some content or interact with it in whatever ways you set up. So we decided to make use of the organic groups module for two parts of the site. One of these is the collaborative brief section that Fabian alluded to earlier. We're actually gonna to get to that all the way at the end. But the other part is courses. So the big question is, why are courses ideal to be organic groups? And 
The answer is they're right there on the screen. Learners can join specific courses. You can set up individualized user roles for courses like mentors. And contacts are grouped together by course. So we can do cool things like have uh, your chat buddies organized by which course they're taking with you. So before we get uh, a little bit more in depth, I'm just going to show you what a course looks like in the PSI Marketing Academy. So at the bottom, you've got your synopsis. And the operative button right here is that big, big green dive in button. Now, what that actually does, and we'll see that in a moment, is at least if you haven't started the course yet, this is going to allow you to join the organic group. And it was a big page, so I broke it in two. The second part is people who are associated with this group. So we have mentors and people taking the course. So behind the scenes, this is actually just a list of users in the organic group. So to make this a little bit more uh, understandable, I'm going to act, show you a screencast right now of how this would look for a user and try to explain a little bit about what's going on in each of these parts. Let's hope YouTube is behaving today. But we're going to start out this particular slide on the homepage of PSI right here. Um, so you'll see we've got some of these uh, same words we talked about before, collaboration, skills. And if you click there, you can see the courses. Right now, since this is a pilot project, we only have one. But as you go down and click to check out the course, and just wait for our user to catch up here. Right, we get back to this page that we just saw. And at this point, the user can go and dive into the course. And like I said, what's actually happening there, in addition to being uh, taken to the beginning of the course, which we'll see in a second, you're also joining the organic group, which means that you have been granted a user role. In this case, it would just be you know, course participant. And you know, as you get to the course, you actually have some rights now in this organic group. Now, one of the ways that this becomes useful later on is if you look at the side on the right right here, we've got a sidebar, one of which is actually a contact sidebar. So you'll see some people here listed, your mentors and people grouped by their um, skill level, in this case, marketing team member. But you can actually go and chat with these users at any point because they're in the same course as you. Yeah, and um, chat is the next uh, screencast we want to show. I've already outlined it a little. So really what um, this is making possible is um, we have one example person here. He's called uh, John Doe. And um, John Doe is new to the Marketing Academy. And um, but he now is Vanessa Bloom. Um, so he contacts her and is ask, asking her um, how it's going with her brief and um, can, t can just um, chat here. And um, this is kind of the learning experience I've uh, spoken to before. Um, we just l let them talk a little. Um, that um, it's very easy for people to collaborate here with chat. And chat is ideal for short things um, where you don't want to write an email and need a little more interactivity. And especially, you can find other people in your course. And here is Eusebia Bib, who is uh, the mentor on this course. And um, and uh, John Doe is asking if Eusebia could, could help him a little um, with his brief. And, um, of course, that's no problem. He should just send it over for review, and how he does that, we'll see a little later. So, um, yep. So, but what's most interesting about this um, integration is, first of all, this module is called Drupal Chat, and um, the integration we did there um, with the um, that you could just um, integrate with the Drupal chat with just some custom JavaScript. It's not very complicated, and um, you can always contact any one of us, and we can kind of share a little more of that. But if we would have put all custom code in here, it would have blown the session away. Um, 
So, um, but what's very interesting about the chat is, chat is a little risky for Drupal side, and I'm just telling you that. <laughs> Because if you're just installing the Drupal chat module, it, there will be a lot of load on the server and we had the problems that users were kind of like popping on and off. So uh, what we did is we used the Node.js integration and um, anyone here familiar with Node.js? Yeah, some people a little. For the rest of you, what Node.js allows you is kind of like, um, we have to explain it like that. You have this real big Drupal system, which is heavy to load, but very, very powerful. And this, or this, is Node.js. It's very tiny, it's very responsive, it's very fast, it's lightweight, and it's not putting much load on your server. So um, if for every chat message, the whole of Drupal needs to be loaded, and you need to frequently ask, hey Drupal, is there a new chat message? Then Drupal will just say, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if you're using Node.js, then you kind of have this little quick thing that's kind of like just telling to Drupal once it has collected some chat messages, hey Drupal, save this chat messages in the history, and it's all responsive and fast. So. Unfortunately, the whole Node.js setup would again blow this session away, but um, two hints of warning here. First of all, we had restricted access control here. So um, we restricted everything besides the login pages for anonymous users. Unfortunately, we locked out Node.js. <laughs> and to debug that took hours. Um, so don't do that. The other thing is, um, if you want to get Node.js working, get Node.js working first, kind of, without Drupal chat. Get the basic functionality working. Use the Node.js quick start, kind of, assistant internally to Drupal. And then the chances of success are much higher. It's still a little complicated, but um, it's getting better and better every day. So, yeah, um, if you want Drupal chat, it is worth exploring Node.js. Yeah, and incidentally, that uh, that noise Fabian made, that Drupal, uh, there isn't a module yet for that instead of an error log, but if anybody here wants to develop it, I think that would be a worthy contribution. Ah. Um, the next thing we have is achievements. So. I've talked a little about gamification before, but I've only talked what we did, not how we did it. Now we come to the way how to do it. So um, one of the easiest way to add gamification to your site is the um, achievements module written by Marbles if also of Trellon. Um, and it allows you to award badges and achievements when certain tasks have been done. Um, unfortunately, the module currently has no kind of like guy graphical user interface where you could just click, well, I want this and this and that to define those. So currently you still need a little custom code um, to do that. And um, please don't be scared. <laughs> but I trust you all want to learn more and we'll show a code example now. It's easy. So. What you will need to do is you will need to create a custom module or have a custom module created and um, you implement this hook achievements info. So it would be my module achievements info and you would just um, return the structure like where you call this achievement. Here I've shown again the chat ninja as an example and um, we define the title, description, the points, um, we didn't use achievements with points, we used another module, so we used achievements pointless to achieve that. Um, and then you have to set the images which are locked and unlocked, and that's kind of all you need. So you have a, um, a locked badge, an unlocked badge, and you can also do some more things, like you could set a secret key, then it would not show up for anyone, it, you can set it invisible. There's a little more possibilities, and one of the not yet. 
One of the nicer things we did was um, we used this variable get, psi underscore chat ninja, and that allowed us to, once we had defined these achievements, to make them customizable with just some little glue code. And again, I'm happy to provide that to anyone interested. Um, and then the client was able to make out of the chat ninja the master magician or whatever. And the other part of achievements, now that you have all of your badges defined, is kind of how to award those achievements. And um, there's two parts to that. Let's say we have a hook where we're kind of getting this new chat message. And then we can kind of get an information out of the achievement storage, like how much has this user chatted again. Then we increase it by one and we store it again. And now we kind of say, well, has this user chatted 100 times? Yes. OK. So let's unlock his achievement. And we just call this achievements unlocked with the achievement we've defined earlier. And that's it. There's also the possibility to do this via rules. And we show rules a little later. Um, but it's very straightforward. You just select the event like user has posted his first node. And then you unlock the achievement. Here's a, here are some of our achievements we had. So that would be, um, for example, we had a pilot participant badge for the people who had been in this first pilot. We had the audience insight skill once they have completed their work product and once they have finished their course and um, also the chat ninja. And if someone had like 300 commands or something and forced 30 days had certain points, he was an export contributor. Ah, and the next thing is points. So um, points, as I've already said, Super Mario, you're just collecting points. And um, again, it's easy um, with Drupal to do points integration, to do gamification. And for that, we um, have used the user points module. And um, we'll just show in a quick screencast how this is set up in the backend. So here we have our rules. And there's a lot on this side. So Almost everything you can now with Drupal 7 do with rules. So, and we have the special rule where someone filled out a profile field. And um, once, uh, so for rules, we always have an event. Then we have some certain conditions. And then we have an action. In this case, the action is award points. And once this is clicked, um, we have um, we have to check who to award this points. This is a c account here, and rules makes it very easy to do here because it gives you kind of this drill down interface where you can select. Then of course we need to check how many points we want to have, and um, some other things like we want to insert points, the message to store, and. Um, the category. So um, the best is just to try it out, install the user points module, install the rules module, take something simple like viewing a node and just giving some points out of that. And you'll be very soon getting a feeling of how easy it is with Drupal to do um, this gamification and points. So, and now we want to see how this is looking on the front end. So now that we've set it all up on the back end, we want to see how John Doe is experiencing this as a user. So we have this edit your profile settings. And again, there's some custom glue code that's just showing how to, um, the descriptions of the fields. So we kind of have like a progress bar here. And um, John Doe is filling out his nickname, which is Johnny. And um, he's speaking two languages. We soon know wha which ones. And um, while John is uh, filling out this, um, 
the system will kind of, after this is filled out, do a comparison of which fields are available, which fields have been filled out for the first time. And once we save this, um, we save all the points and here we get 80 points for filling the profile field. Again, one little word of warning, when we first did this, we had like five messages which were saying, you filled out a profile field, you got 20 points. Um, again, little glue code, too much for a beginner session, can be provided to anyone interested. Um, allow us to um, just group these points together and with that we have this little grouped 80 points for filling the profile field. So, and with that I give back to Ephraim and he will tell you more about the collaboration and the briefs. I see a question here. Let's just note we're going to have some time for questions at the end of the session. So feel free to write it down, whatever you need to make sure you remember it. Um, all right, so collaborative briefs. Uh, we're finally up to this. We've been telling you all this time we're going to get to it at the end. We're finally here. And this, in my opinion, is really the coolest part of the PSI Marketing Academy. Um, to refresh your memories, we wanted to build a system that made it pretty much impossible for anybody to get through this entire course without having to interact closely with other people. So instead, what we did is we created this creative brief or collaborative brief. We've used both terms. And this actually requires some interaction in order to finish the course. So to finish this up, you have to do this brief, which you could think of as homework or maybe even better, you know, kind of a finished product, uh, like we said. This is a brief that you can actually then use and submit for any number of things, like it might be a grant application or something like that. Um, and as part of this, there are several stages which we used Workbench moderation for, and we'll get down to that in a little bit. Um, so they are draft, um, I think that's pretty straightforward. Peer review, where your peers and other people who are taking this course can be asked to give you some feedback and some comments on your work. Uh, mentor feedback, where the mentor, who we've also seen, can take a look, give you any feedback, make some changes for you. And finally, the approval stage, where your country representative, the person who is kind of highest on the totem pole in your geographic area, that person is going to actually have to approve your brief, make sure you did it right and pass you before you can finally publish it. So, peer review. Uh, if you remember earlier, we had said that organic groups was used for courses and briefs. So, why do we want to use organic groups for briefs? So the answer is, we've got a lot of different people who are going to be touching this, um, and we want a way to easily grant access and be able to get them involved in the formation of the brief. So each brief is actually its own organic group. And as part of the peer review process, the author is going to share a first draft with a group of peer reviewers. They're going to add some feedback. But what you're actually doing when you do that is you're inviting, or actually not even inviting, you're just adding that person to your organic group. And they have the peer reviewer user role, which doesn't allow them to edit, but it will allow them to view it before it's published. We're going to have a little screencast now about the peer review process and what this looks like from both the author side and the peer reviewer side. So this over here, as we're loading, this is what a brief looks like uh, in the draft stage. And you'll see we have these two buttons over here, one of which is add peer reviewer. There's a little autocomplete field. You can select anybody who is a member of the organic group, so anybody who's a member of the course. You add them. And now we're headed off to Vanessa's email. She was just asked to review John's brief. So we've got a nice link in there. She can get in very easily, get to the brief, and take a look. So you'll notice from her point of view, things look a little bit different right now. We've got these two icons and buttons to the right of each section. She just clicked one of those, a little plus sign, and she's now taken to a comment field where she can make a comment on that section. It's, this is all Laura Mipsum right now, so she's just going to say, I'm making a comment. But the nice thing about this is that by dividing these into sections, and we can answer any questions about that at the end if you're curious about this, 
you can actually make comments on an individual section, which if you've got a big brief makes it a lot easier to keep all the conversations straight and make sure you know, you're not mixing things up. So this also, like a lot of things in this uh, site, makes heavy use of the rules module. In this case, we have a rule that controls that email notification that you just saw. In this case, um, the event user has been granted an OG role, and that OG role is peer reviewer. And right, we make sure the content is the right type, et, et cetera. We set some conditions. And the action is to send a mail. So uh, we're not going to take a look at that actual email, but we can use the, to the right ty types of tokens to make sure that the email is going to go to the person who's been added to the group, that it's going to reference the correct brief when it links back, and all sorts of other things that brief, uh, that rules does really well. But um, we tried this out um, in the pilot and um, we had this first pilot group and it turned out all of that was not yet collaborative enough. Because what happened was very frustrating for some people. Um, they were working on these briefs and people wanted to work together on them. So they gave themselves feedback, but what actually happened was several people grouped together and worked together on one brief. But now in the course they were progressing just one person and the other two still had to do their own brief. So of course they could write the same, but kind of we were in a situation where kind of um, we wanted that this whole group of people could be kind of collaborating not only on the brief by chatting and reviewing, but also by editing the brief itself. So um, what the idea was kind of that several people were invited as peer editors to edit a brief and then those um, could work together and once the brief was approved, all of them would progress up through the course and get their reward and have that in their portfolio. So it was like they own all own the brief. And again, um, organic groups made that very easy, which um, again was, was a reason why it's a good choice to have this brief be an organic group by itself and so we have courses as organic groups and briefs are also organic groups. So um, we have this OG role that allows the specific collaborators to work simultaneously on the draft. So, um, and this role is called peer editor. And um, here we kind of showing how this is working. So, um, we're just selecting the other button at this point, which is just um, adding the peer editor. So um, I now want um, this person to um, be able to edit my brief. And again, they're getting an email um, that there's now this brief for them to edit and that they now can together collaborate on that. So we got again a direct link to the brief and um, by clicking on it, they directly get to the edit screen of the brief and can now start editing in and just edit the brief normally. And OG kind of made this permissioning very easy to do here. And um, so let's say this section is not yet correct. So they're just putting it something else. And um, again, they can save and once they saved, um, a notification goes out to the other peer editors that someone made a change. And again, um, it allows very easily to kind of collaborate on, on these things. And, um, but especially for gamification, it was important um, that they were all progressing up and they were all getting their rewards um, in that. So, um, and then um, everyone can also choose to submit this brief now to the mentor. Not only save it, but submit it to the mentor and go up in the workflow stage.
So, um, and that's kind of the last part of, um, of our system we devised here, and that was kind of where Workbench came in. Workbench is a very useful module for workflow. It's also a little more complicated than just adding a workflow field to Node and transitioning through. Um, but what Workbench especially allows you to do is to have something published, like there's a published brief on the website, um, and at the same time, you can work on a new draft and put this through the workflow again and then replace the published version with a newly approved version. And that's especially what Workbench is very good for. But Workbench also has this moderation stages. And that's kind of the last thing we want to show is kind of how it rules makes it, again, very easy to transition for, through the different moderation stages. So what we will see here, once YouTube is loading, ah, I know. Um, we have these rules, and from the rules, um, we have this transition moderation stage. We also have lots of other rules where um, we are directly going into the workflow. And um, again, as I said, um, if you're thinking about writing custom code, it is often easier to just write a rule and um, be able to kind of site build a site completely without having to write much custom code because rules is so powerful. So now we kind of click on it, go, go into that rule. Um, this is a little more complicated because um, we have this moderation transition. Now we add a so-called or group where we kind of, it's either in the state um, draft or it's in the peer review state and then it goes to the session leader stage it's still called session leader kind of as internal name but it's really the mentor stage and once it does that we have an action to send an email and again we send an email to the account um, that now um, this brief have been moved up um, in this uh, peer review stage and um, asking the mentor, could you please review this brief? And then he can again has a workflow control to either set it back to peer review, hey, do some more work or send it over to the country representative. So that concludes our initial presentation here. Uh, thank you for coming and listening and participating. Um, in a moment, we're going to have some time for some questions. Uh, just note that we have that microphone up there for the audience so that DrupalCon can make sure to record all of your questions as well. All right. Hello. Hello. I want to talk about gamification and these user points. Uh, when you reach some level of points, you get this badge. But is it possible also to give some additional things like roles or, I mean, to attract people to get these points, not only because they are going to have a badge, but because of them will have some, I don't know, dashboard or some extra functionality? It is definitely possible to do that um, with the user points. Um, and actually, if you get this um, expert contributor badge, you got some more rights already on the site. Um, it's just we didn't show that. Again, it would be very easy. You would set up a rule using the user points threshold. So user gets awarded points. You would check, has a user like 10,000 points or whatever is needed? And then you are just using rules to grant the user a special role, like a Drupal role, and then you could have more um, possibilities to do. But yes, that would be possible. Okay, thank you. I have a, <coughs> excuse me, I have a question about the collaboration. Um, it seems like what we saw here were all looked like Drupal, either CCK or some kind of internally stored data. Um, and working with faculty members at universities who are doing collaboration not only within the university but with others, um, they would be working in things like Microsoft Word or maybe some other kind of um, non-web-based uh, documents. Is it possible to integrate that kind of 
um, that kind of collaboration in something like this? Um, uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, for one thing, um, obviously, if you edit something on your local Word document and um, we cannot send out an email to your peers uh, that you did some change, but what we made possible using a technology called LiveDocX is that you could export your um, brief to Word document and actually some groups choose to kind of um, create an initial draft because um, the briefs are also kind of not empty at the beginning, but they um, we're using the note clone module to kind of clone uh, a common template for each brief, and then you already get something pre-filled out, and some users just chose to use the download button to download a Word document, work on it, and um, kind of together on a computer, and then they would just put it in back in a section. So what we did not have was a kind of re-import from Word, um, but we but we had kind of the possibility to always go to Word, just the final brief we um, at this point wanted to have um, be um, within the web interface. I guess the question I was having, I know that there, I forget the names off the top of my head, but there are file management modules within Drupal that will allow you to save things to the server and bring things back. Um, and I don't know how you do the versioning, maybe using Git as a back end or something like that, but have the ability to um, add that as kind of a different direction for something like this. Uh, it would definitely be possible to um, kind of instead of um, having the brief um, just, I mean, you could just remove all the fields that are there on the brief, add a file attachment field instead. And then I think um, you would not be able to discuss sections, but only the whole brief. But probably that would be fine, or people could just re-upload new documents. And again, you could use the Drupal um, versioning information where kind of um, you're versioning on, or you are having revisions on, on a note. So the older attachments are still available. And then I think it would be pretty easy to extend this to um, be able to do kind of the same workflow with um, with files instead of uh, direct data input. But yeah, that's a good suggestion. Uh, I just built a, a custom achievements system without rules and without the achievements module, so that was pretty uh, impressive. And I was curious, does it have any sort of toast functionality and can you customize it at all? Like say when you earn the achievement, does it you know, say, hey, you've earned the achievement or does it just unlock it and then shows up? It uh, Achievements module has a very nice pop-up. Um, so if you earn an achievement, the next time you log in, the next time um, you can uh, be there and you have that, a very little nice shiny pop-up comes up and says, "Yay, you earned an achievement! You are now you now have that badge you have on your user page. Um, you have all your achievements listed. You have those listed. You can still unlock. So there's um, an incentive to uh, start unlocking, and you can also put a little like the description help text there in saying, "Hey, um, chat more, and you will finally get that." <laughs> So, and um, again, it's Drupal. So, um, achievements has nice hooks. You can also hook into the achievement pre process before you are seeming. And um, what I did um, sometime was also um, to just have something which is like secret and then to have different texts based on that. And what's also a good way to do it is needs a little custom code is you can create a taxonomy and then kind of define some thresholds or something there, and then just get that taxonomy and define your achievements um, dynamically. That's also what um, would be a good way kind of to get this more UI oriented. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, um, it's, it's a very powerful module and it gives you a lot out of the box. And as I said, you don't need to do this achievements unlocked. We actually have some rules I didn't show where it's just has a user, user get awarded points, 1,000 points, okay, unlock achievement, you have that and that skill. Great. Thanks. Right. And we do have some uh, UI on the dashboard as well to see 
you know, for instance, for some of these points-based uh, badges, you know, you're 76% of the way there and you still need to earn this other badge as a prerequisite for getting this one. So you can show that to people and make it a little bit more, uh, you know, transparent to them. I can see where, uh, where the site would be good at, at kind of teaching one kind of uh, knowledge template, so to speak. Um, and I can see departments making their classes. I was wondering how much you guys have explored um, making these play nice with other LMSs via like the Tin Can API or something like that to allow professors to say, create their stand-up site, but also have it communicate with the central uh, system for the university as well. Yeah. So, I mean, that's not something that we really focus on in this particular project, though. You know, since this was uh, right for PSI, it's a nonprofit organization that doesn't really have that sort of a need. Um, yeah, so we did integrate with something that is very much LMS related and that's Squam Cloud. Right. So um, yeah. we, as part of that project, we did an initial port of the Drupal 6 Squam module to Drupal 7. It's online in the sandbox and it w worked for everything we needed. Um, we kind of just used to exchange the preview button with launch and that's it. And then we also built some custom code to um, be able to show the courses directly in a pop-up and not kind of you have to have one pop-up and another pop-up, but kind of to embed things more. Um, that was a little challenging, but worked out well in the end. So that was kind of the integration we did. Um, the person creating the course was creating it in SCORM and uploading their things, their videos, and um, other learning facilities, and we are just embedding the SCORM videos. Oh, okay, perfect. Right, so yeah, you can you know, actually embed the content from other LMSs, but uh, the actual structure of the course and the order was actually all done in Drupal, and you know, to some extent you could have just dropped YouTube videos in there if you really wanted to, though this is obviously a little bit more slick. Yeah, hi, um, I was just wondering if you thought about sort of collaborative conflicts, like where somebody edits a, you know, their, their brief and somebody else is editing at the same time. Is there a way to notify somebody? Or if, uh, um, about that at all? Interestingly, that problem came not really up uh, when we kind of did go to the peer editor stages. Um, first of all, I mean, it's not very helpful if Drupal gives you that message. Um, another user has modified this content. <laughs> But uh, on the other hand, Drupal already protects against it. So um, what we could have done if we wanted or could still do is install the content log module, which would then give you kind of give one user exclusive access for, for that part um, to log it. And um, then um, you can unlock it. It's just a note, so that would work well. The other possibility that we did not explore was so sections actually are field collections, which gave some little trouble at cloning, <laughs> but we figured it out in the end. Um, so what would be possible is that one user edits section A, another user edits section B, and they would not conflict. Right, right. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention, too, is I've been working on a module called Shared Access, which kind of works a lot like um, how uh, Google Docs works in sharing. So it's a field that you attach to a node and allows you to share with other users or other organic groups. So I just thought I'd point that out in case you're interested in looking that up. Sometime. Cool. Yeah, so that, dev stage. That's really cool, actually, kind of as, as a next phase. You know, we were definitely thinking about something a little bit more Google Docs-y and allowing you know, comments that are connected to actual phrases rather than sections and more inline editing. So that's something I think that would be worth taking a look at. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's still in dev, so I could use some help if anyone wants to check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you so much. The collaboration looks really good. Um, in your next phase, when you start thinking about after the brief is done and the grading begins, can you talk a little bit about how you're going to approach the, the, the one of the stickiest features that we find from our faculty, which is a grade book. Um, so for this um, courses, there is no real grading in that because um, they're kind of non-profit organization that are 
working together and working to make the world a better place, kind of. Um, so um, what happens after you finish the brief is kind of um, you get more, like three more videos and uh, articles that give you information. Now that you've published your brief, what do you do with it to get it widespread to um, make the most of the marketing material you've now created. So um, there um, is no grading stage in that system. Okay, thank you. <coughs> cool, now this, uh, this has been a really great presentation, thank you. Um, I was wondering where the people are that are, that are the target population that's supposed to use this and because uh, PSI is about um, developing countries and I was wondering how people can participate in sort of low bandwidth situations or where they're using their smartphones and I was also curious to find out if you thought about using you know email or listserv type functionality to let people collaborate by email with each other and whether you looked at Og mailing list which is a, a module that extends organic groups discussions um, so that they basically turn into a mailman mailing list. Um, in general, um, there was at this project no real requirement besides standard accessibility guides. And um, it was more like um, giving the user a very slick experience. The site is in our experience quite fast and it's pretty lightweight from the design. There's not many graphics or anything um, in that. So um, there should be no problem at all in that. Um, we were kind of restricted to to this pilot um, in that, so there was not much thought given to um, this functionality, um, like doing it via mail or something, or um, doing it um, on the mobile phone only or something. I think the site works pretty well, but as I said, there was no scope for that. and. Um, let me tell you that it was enough to build it. <laughs> that way. I'd like to talk more with you about it afterwards. And I just want to also point out there was a guy named Kyle Matthews um, who developed Edouglou. I don't know if you've seen that. But he, uh, it seems like an early version of what you've done um, or similar in some ways using organic groups, but also with Aug mailing list. And he also used Etherpad, you know, PiratePad. You know, which he tried to integrate into the collaboration space. Oh, that's um, interesting. But yeah, anyway, this is awesome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one last question. My, mine was just about m uh, the mobility. Just if there was any consideration to uh, just optimizing that, because um, a lot of work that I'm doing is with some virtual schools and stuff, and they're starting to actually hand out like iPads and uh, tablets to their students uh, that are like on a cart that moves from class to class to class. But it's like decentralized, so a lot of the content that I'm having to develop has to go, it has to be compatible with both that and also a traditional laptop. So were you creating like uh, just one site kind of responsive fits all or were you actually, did you actually develop a, mo a mobile version of the site or what, yeah, there was just no scope for that? There was no scope for responsive design. I think it works pretty well on an iPad, but uh, right. we did not really test or try. Um, yeah. But the, it all generally ended up being relatively light as far as the actual yes. weight to the end client? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the other thing to note is that, uh, I mean, they're a nonprofit organization with offices in tens of countries all over the world. And the target audience for this was largely but not exclusively employees of their, uh, you know, sub offices overseas. So a lot of these people were actually, you know, their internet connections might not have been great, but they were largely on computers. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So primarily desktop. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I think. Okay. Thank thanks you. a lot. <laughs> I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed the session. I hope uh, you will build the next generation learning management system, and I hope you will have much fun on DrupalCon. We now have a keynote from Dries. So enjoy, guys. <laughs> thanks. And rate our session. <laughs>